Okay. Yep. Yeah, one was the surface oceans on Mars. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sub yeah. The oceans. Yeah. Subsurface, right? I mean, they're oceans underneath the ground, which is not really that surprising. No. It took them quite a long time to. Um to uh, release that little tidbit, considering they've had a rover up there for 12 years, apparently. Oh, um, yeah, they, they, they've they known. I mean, it's been a theory uh, for decades that there's water underneath the surface. Uh, it's a cinch that being a Saturnian, you know, former Saturnian body, that, of course, it had a bunch of, of water uh, on the surface. The, the water that's missing is probably stolen by Venus, you know. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so yeah. here's one of yours, Ramon. Here's an electrical plasma mystery. The oil on the body, the alcohol burns normally. Cups applied to the body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. so what do, you guys think? what do you guys think of that? That was a pretty weird one, pretty weird case of, so, uh, you know, the, the alcohol – I mean, obviously, I was able to get the alcohol to burn normally to get all the cups attached to the guy. But then once he's been treated, and this is a healthy guy, so he's not big and fat and got a lot of water coming out of his body while he's being. He's got some. There's a little bit of fog in the cups, um, and that's probably the key. But it is just bizarre. I mean, I am literally saturating the cotton ball with alcohol, and it was not wanting to catch fire. I mean, it's catching fire, but it's like. Um, the flame's a third to half the size, and it's actually going out quickly. And uh, that should not never happen, right? I mean, alcohol should always burn. Um, now, there's there's probably some less oxygen because he's been on the table for a little bit, breathing it. But the door was open, so it, it's not like there was an absence of fresh oxygen circulating. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like the air is on and the door is open, so there should be fresh alcohol coming in. So I, I found that really interesting is that uh, the plasma seemed to behave um, in a in a different manner uh, than expected for a normal chemical reaction. Like basically, under the current chemistry paradigm, that fire should burn at full force so long as there's any oxygen and then just go out when there's none, right? It shouldn't uh, like taper itself down or anything like that. And the idea that it was oil can't be possible because these are brand new cotton balls with brand new alcohol being applied. Um, so basically the whole thing was very, very fishy. Uh, and and I found most intriguing, uh, intriguing, I, I had a discussion with the patient about it. Uh, so the question is, is it just the humidity coming out of his very, very healthy body? Like this guy is like, you know, 1% body fat at most, or uh, is it some kind of uh, ether that would actually, like, if, if his body has released, because there is a thing in Chinese medicine where you do not breathe in the air that comes out of the cups uh, from people. So if, if something is released by the body that is anti-supportive of, of life and it's in the air, could it interfere with the uh, chemical reaction uh, of the alcohol with the with the uh, oxygen, and uh, I don't see why it couldn't be. You know, I don't see why that would be a completely invalid hypothesis right away. That we, you know, that I have to go with humidity in the room. And here's the thing: people, I've had people who had so much moisture Oil. in their cups that there's actual water droplets, like big fat water droplets. And he wasn't like that. It was just a fog. And it wasn't all the cups. It was just the ones in the upper torso. And I'm so, lighting this on the other side. I'm lighting this on the other side of the room. Yeah. So, Ramon, what would cause, what would, would that, a fire department use to basically smother a fire that gases off well, they, and smother it? They use, they, use, they use fire retardants like thing. powders. Yes, but I what I mean, myself for a second. fire retardants, they have a lot of, well, uh, they got a lot of similar chemicals in them to some of our uh, modern nanoplastic type stuff. So could his body, he have been in an area where he's consumed um, inadvertently through food, air, whatever, particles, whatever, where he's consumed 
these nanoparticles which um, would smother fire. In other words, so when you started drawing, you're drawing this um, chemicals or air and you've got these microparticles in it and they're reacting just to, to kill the fire. You know, so they're, they're taking, they're smothering the fire, in other words. That's a very interesting hypothesis. It, the problem is that he, that he eats so well. So how do you account for that? I mean, this guy yeah, is yeah, really, I really fit. He's a, fi he's a fitness buff. Yeah, is, there something that, is there something that could transform the alcohol before it's uh, combusted? Uh, from the alcohol into something else. No, like no the pr the pr no, the procedures. The procedures the same each time. Cotton balls, soak it with alcohol, light it with a lighter immediately. So there's no time for any kind of transformation. There's and the control light, of the experiment. They're both the same. There's no. And you light it away the, from the person, don't you, Ramon? And then you put it. Yeah, correct. Other, yeah, so, correct. Other, so other it burns all right. Room. So you light it. It's burning all right. You get it over the top no. of the cup. No, 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 it was already burning at only a third to half the flame that it should be uh, <laughs> if it were uh, as, as when they were first put on. So if you went in, so if you went in that room today and lit a cotton bud with alcohol on it, you would expect it to it'll, burn. it'll burn normal, I bet. I mean, I'll check, but uh, it'll burn normal. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sure. Just a second. Yeah, there was something that his body was giving off on there. Where's everybody gone? Yeah, there was something that his body was giving off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just don't. I just don't know anything about it. To be honest, uh, I can't. I don't know the techniques or anything about them really. Um, it's li literally, guys. You know, you 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 use a clamp. You grab a cotton ball. You soak it in alcohol. You light it. And uh, and yeah. by the way, here's another thing. So the fire going into the globe, uh, right? These are new globes, not ones that have humidity. Yep. Uh, I pulled them off the shelf. And when I stuck the fire in the globe, it, did, it wasn't creating the same vacuum. Now that should be impossible, right? Because the, 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 the oxygen that's inside, because the fire didn't go out. So it wasn't like I put it into a, a, a globe of carbon dioxide. So the question is, uh, why would the such just because it's a small flame doesn't mean that it shouldn't create the the, the vacuum it should create the vacuum and uh, and it wouldn't create a strong vacuum and one of the cups came loose again these ones did not have any humidity inside the globe and that's my point is that like whatever is making him feel terrible it perhaps has nothing to do with humidity it could be nanoparticles but the problem is that he eats so well I mean to me you know i'm literally at a mcdonald's so like why would this guy's uh alcohol cotton balls new ones not want to burn and then when the flame no matter that it's a fl uh you know a, a, a third to half the size of the normal big flame the flame went into the cup you flash in flash out real quick like that it sucks up the oxygen uh, so that it drops the pressure so that it creates a vacuum Mm -hmm. And that's how it sticks. I, I asked for no whipped cream. No whipped cream. Uh, and so, like, you know, this is bizarre physics. And it's the first time I've ever seen it. Again, if he was a really, really fat guy, uh, and it was like the water, the, all the cups that had fog were like drops of water, I'd be like, okay, the room is full of too much humidity. If the door had been closed, I would say, okay, the there's not been enough oxygen in the room and there's just too much carbon dioxide. Yeah, but the but problem is both those things are controlled for in the way that then in, in the results that I've explained. So I don't know how to account for these kinds of things is, is my, is my point. And that's why I proposed it as a, as a puzzle for the group and for the crowd. I'd be interested in anybody who watches our show. Uh, and I will upload both of those today. Um, uh, but I would be interested to hear some hypotheses. The only thing I can come up with is that indeed the body does produce a form of ether. So it transforms, uh, the air ether and then through metabolic processes this is putting out this prickly, this stuff that I can feel sometimes in the electric fields in my hands is prickly uh, energy. 
And that that energy is itself what aggravates the person beyond normal. You know, like obviously, if it aggravates them enough, their liver function changes. You see changes in their BUN numbers, creatinine, ASC, ALT. Uh, however, when they're you know within normal limits, uh, or if their body is just strong, like his is really strong, you know his numbers aren't going to go a uh, go whack, right? But he might be storing tons of it, and it reminds me of a case where a guy, you know, he worked at uh, Toyota, and his body had these like burn plaques all over his body where he's cooking from the inside. Well, how is he cooking from the inside? They're like, oh, you know, it looks like psoriasis. Okay, fair enough. So when you needle him, though, the room fills up with this prickly energy that when you walk in makes you cough. It doesn't smell per se, although he did have a, a burned, a burned uh, smell to him. Uh, but it's just the room feels saturated with something that shouldn't be there. Is he and working, I have a cerebral. Ramon, is he, is he working out that hard that he's literally overheating his body? Oh, this is a different guy. This guy was not that healthy, and his wife was massive, just just massive. Yeah. And uh, and uh, she also had prickly energy, so some of it had to be their lifestyle, you know, uh, diet yeah. and such. Now, I have a cerebral palsy case, and listen to this. She weighs under 50 pounds, and she's nearly 50 years old. And uh, she was definitely having seizures because of all the solar storms. I, I mapped it all out, and it was very obvious, you know, if the proton density is near zero, and the next day it shoots up to six to 10 uh, protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, that night she's having seizures and wailing. Okay, now something came out of the body to where not only in the room did she smell like smoke, which makes sense because her mom smokes, but then at the, at the grocery store, not only did her mom uh, smell it, but somebody else even commented that they could smell toast, like bread, like toasted bread. And then she had half as much come out of the body the next time. And guess what? Her seizures have gone way down and she's no longer caterwauling in the night, even though, of course, the sun is still active. So my point is that I don't think the sun caused it, but that she was near threshold for whatever reason. The body has a capacitor holding in this form of metabolic ether, uh, what I call ejectum. And uh, then the sun just overwhelmed the nervous system. It was at its it was at its wits end, basically. And was reacting to these excess amount of protons blocking up the system. So the uh, question I, is, I, what, I, I real, think, what I really? Think, I think the moon has the a massive would influence. Be what is eject? Well, of course it has an influence, but in this case, it was directly mapped to the spaceweather.com. But that's not the the real issue. Is does ejectum exist as a as a form of ether that comes out of the body? What am I sensing when I feel this prickly energy with either my hand or it's in the air, it's in the lungs? Uh, and if it if ejectum is a, is just chemical, if it's just chemical, which chemicals are are they so that we can make a med that that uh, basically binds with it and, and makes it inert? And if it's if it's more subchemical, if it's more particulate, why is it so charged? And why is it charged in a way that interferes with the normal charge that that makes life work? So, you Ramon, know? Ramon, could I put this to you? Does that person, um, what sort of footwear would that would those people be wearing? Do those people also um, what I would call grounded? You know, they're often outside with um, their bare, you know, their bare, relatively bare body on the earth. Right, and is does their houses also have that um, high nylon carpet, which gives a lot of static electricity mm. too? I See, don't, so I don't know. I mean, environments that they're living in m more than the food and, and all that they're consuming, and what you've actually done is is basically created that they've now earthed off to the atmosphere instead of to the ground because they're always shielded from earthing to ground i'm just i'm sorry i'm distracted slightly because i i think to get rid of the whipped cream all she did was just blend it in because this mocha lat latte tastes uh, a little too creamy uh so i've taken a lactate pill but i will tell you that 
uh, the cerebral palsy case, obviously she doesn't get really any grounding, right? Cause she's in a wheelchair all the time. Uh, and she can't walk and things like that. I mean, she's completely handicapped. So her body is going to build up. If, if there is such a metabolic process as I've described, uh, the body is going to build up. And if, and if she's in the presence of, of cigarette smoke, the body will already be saturated with a toxin. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other guy, obviously he doesn't smoke. He's a perfectly healthy guy. So I don't know. I would imagine that he gets a fair amount of grounding. He's a pretty active guy. I can't say that he goes hiking a lot or not. I, I have no idea. I don't know the answer to that. But I would say that it's, it is fairly questionable. I, I have to mute myself because my, my Wi-Fi will pick this up. Those runners that they wear, that bloke who does the fitness, those runners and that, well, they, they, they won't let the current through because of the the type of material they're made out of. So he wouldn't be grounding through them. Um, and then in, if he's in a gym, although a lot of that's metal, it's it's onto um, floors that are pretty well insulated. So, yeah, you, you might be releasing that electric charge. What do you think, Nick? Uh, well, I think... Uh... I think the possibility is that, uh, you know, we've got these, these chakra, these energetic systems in us. And uh, I think, the, uh, like you say, if there's some kind of energetic blockage, it might it might affect uh, your organs' ability to take shit out of your blood. Uh, and therefore, it ends up sticking around in your blood or in your, uh, in your, in your tissues. Uh, and maybe that when you suck that out... Uh, um, there's some, other, there's some other unwanted chemicals in there that are, uh, I mean, maybe you're going to have to analyse what the fuck, what gases are in that mix, you know? Uh, yeah, that's the got... problem is that, you know, the clinic is not set up, obviously, as a laboratory, and so it's impossible to get a sample of the air on the fly, and mm -hmm. the, the, the AC, it's always going to be continuous to circulate. It might be a decade or more before I encounter such, a, such <laughs> another event. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ramon, when you get a chance, you got to watch the Weedy Garden movie, right? You'll okay. enjoy it, right? Okay. It's just how, 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 what, what this bloke's done in three years is amazing. You know. Okay. Well earthed and all that too. <laughs> yeah. So you, you got to watch that. How's this relate? To, how's this relate? I mean, just to keep me. I, I I don't know the context. Uh, in the chat, I put I, I put in in a YouTube link to the Weedy Garden movie. So when you get a chance one evening and you're sitting there with your girlfriend, put it on. It's a it's a good movie. It, 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 you know, it's a good show. So it's basically him documenting the last three years of what he's done, right, with this system he created and how he did it. It's it's a quite good. Yeah. yeah. So, it's it's kind of nice to watch those sort of things sometimes. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, People yeah. Uh, have a plan and exactly create through sometimes. And all that. Yep. And, you know, he did have a fairly stressful, like he's a cameraman by trade, tripping all around the world. So it is well, it is quality because he, he is a cameraman by trade, you know. He's got time lapses of plants growing and and all those sorts of things along the way. Um, yeah. So, okay. So we're sitting there one night with Molly. Put that one on Ramon, and I'm sure she'll love you after it. Okay. But <laughs> again, uh, you got there. You got there from what we were talking about, or is this like a totally different topic? No, no, no. I got there from what we were talking about. Hmm. Right. And it's just you know, like it is interesting how. <clears throat> you know, you get these interconnections because, like, when you watch it, you know, like, you'll see, geez, here's, here's a person who's now re really relaxed, but you see how he's getting around doing things, you can understand why. You know, he's he's been able to get himself connected back. In, and, and I know Nick Nick did have plans to do that and they got a bit way laid on you, didn't they, Nick? But Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it, it was the last chance to do it, I think. But uh, but there we are. That's that's the way it is. I would have been pretty well on the way back now, I think. But there we yeah. are. Yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah, yeah so I, that, that's why I posted it. You know, like it's a good relaxing about thing, some of the things you that you often talk about, and that and what this yeah. bloke's achieved in three years, Ramon, doing this um, for him is really good. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think it's you know when I think life up on the mountain with your dog. Um, it was it was a real it was much more spiritual for me than where I am now, you know. Uh, and so I mean, you can hear bloody earth moving machines going over there or something at the moment, vibrating. But uh, but I'm in a um, when I do when I get back in my computer you know, on which I couldn't do up there. Um, I do that here now, um, but then uh, the spiritual side of me disappears. So I, you know, I, I don't. I sort of, uh, I sort of lose some of the intuitions that I, that you know I used to enjoy getting. Mm. Um, um, it's I don't know. You just enter the machine world again, really. You know, uh, but at least, uh, at least uh, I'm picking up the subjects that I left off a year ago. Um, and uh, I mean, for example, I was just looking at my conversations with Jim Jim Wenninger on here. Um, well, I've had a couple of chats with him on here. And uh, yeah, a little a little has changed over over uh, since that since that time in in my uh, line of thought. But still, uh, still the the way off with these star distances. Um, I mean, they say the nearest thing to us, uh, Alpha Centauri, is. is uh, I'm sorry, can we, uh, Nick? Before uh, we switch topic to that, I just want to finish up the other. And and here's here's the thing, though, guys. <clears throat> I love grounding. I go out and uh, do the hidden Kentucky stuff. The problem with that uh, theory is uh, I should have by now had a plethora of people that this happens, right? There should be a ton of people that uh, present with this issue because most people do not get proper grounding. So the issue with the cotton ball should have happened many hundreds of times. I mean, I've seen thousands and thousands of cases uh, and in hundreds of times, I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of opportunities now to have seen a phenomenon like this. And this is the first time I've ever seen that. So that that's the one problem. And then also, again, I can't say for sure that this guy gets out and jogs, you know, uh, out in the dirt or anything like that. I can't say that. Uh, he And he could be around some kind of microplastic or industrial process and his body ejected into the air, some kind of insulin uh, insulator, but I don't have any proof of that. And also, um, it just seems unlikely that his body should uh, be less grounded than the other cases that I've described. And once again, the focus here was... I, I realize that we all want to figure out what's in the air, but the bigger question, if you really stop and think about it, is what could possibly alter the chemical reaction speed uh, where alcohol is blending with oxygen? Because again, as long as there is oxygen, which clearly we both weren't dying, we weren't we weren't right. gasping air. So if there's That's oxygen, awesome. if there's enough oxygen in the air. Nearly, let's say it went down from 16 to 14 percent. It's still a ton of oxygen. That flame should be going full force. There should be nothing in that flame um, the, the, to keep it from burning at a full at a full clip. Period. So the question is, if if a cotton ball that again earlier once soaked it made a flame per, put you know between two and three inches long is now making a flame between a half and and three quarters of an inch long. What is different? The the only thing different in the experience is either a humidity, which again his humidity was not very high compared to a lot of people who put out humidity, uh, or b something else in the air. And mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. It's easy to say, oh, well, a lot of people aren't healthy because of lack of grounding. I agree. I totally agree. 
Um, however, that isn't doesn't seem to be the issue. Now, I do like what Nick was saying. If there if there is a blockage in the body, which the the um, Sinovedics talk about, the blockages like that all the time. If there's a blockage, then very likely uh, there will be a buildup inside the body. But a buildup of what? That's the big question. And in and in the Ayurvedic, they do have uh, you know ether as a diagnosis. So I suppose that ether is what builds the builds and the basis in their their five elements. But also uh, that you can have an ether diagnosis. And this is an interesting question: is like if there is a form of ether that comes out of the body because of the metabolic processes, and we don't get rid of it, is that what creates this prickly energy that builds up? And can be felt using the electric uh, field uh, measuring of the palm, you know, like using your hands to actually feel. Because also, don't sometimes their fields don't feel prickly and hot. Sometimes they feel cold or like a giant vacuum that's sucking uh, deep into the into the void. Sometimes there it, it feels windy and it blows on your hand like a little like a little fan is coming out of their body. There's a lot of different ways that it feels. I I just happen to be focusing on the prickly one because uh, this guy's yeah. a, bit of a bit of a prickly type, but that doesn't mean that he's a prick. <laughs> oh, I understand. Well, yeah, I think uh, I think back in in the 16th century, um, sort of uh, medics used to refer to the four humors, didn't they? The body, uh, right? Melancholy. Uh, What's it? Sanguinity. Uh, um, melancholy, new phlegmatic or something, pneumatic. There's something to do with, uh, yeah, the, there's, there's melon. Oh, I can't remember what the four humours are anyway, but uh, that's kind of how they, di they uh, decided uh, how they're going to bleed people because uh, they thought they thought the, these humours were concerning the blood. So they decided... Uh, you know, diagnose you with you, your phlegmatic or you're too sanguine or you're uh, too uh, to do something to do with your stomach, your lungs, your blood, uh, the hit four humours, and uh, then they decide uh, where they're going to take the blood from you uh, to uh, to release these uh, humours. Right. Uh, uh, Maybe this, maybe this, uh, it's alluding to some system uh, that these these medics could kind of sense physically uh, with diagnosis like you were doing, and uh, that they, they attributed it to these four different types. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, um, uh, like you say, I mean, other ways. Uh, You've only had, ever had this one experience of it, Ramon. So it's uh, right. You know, until you, until you can, you know, repeat well. the 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 accidental experiment. Yes. So Ramon, did they all happen say within a couple of days of each other? No, no, no. The case is, uh, uh, well, the 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 cerebral palsy case has nothing at all to do with it. And I'm only pointing out that that there was a solar uh, uh, effect, and that her body people release stuff all the time, you know, um, you know. But the smokiness that that was a totally different room, right? Because she can't even go up the stairs, uh, and it was on a different week, uh, so not not related at all. And then. The other yep. case that I mentioned, the Toyota guy, I mean, that's years and years ago now. That's in a whole different building, et cetera. But it points out that his body had so much of this stuff, it was burning him from the inside. And yeah. when it finally ejected out of the body, it made me go into a coughing fit. My lungs couldn't even take what was in the room. And it didn't have a particularly uh, strong smell, uh, not like the cerebral palsy case where all the smoke came out. And and she's not the worst smoke case. There's a there was a case of a woman whose body put out a like a, a, a so much cigarette smoke that it was like an ashtray in a cigarette house, and the room had to be closed for the rest of the day um, for it to circulate out. And after her body did that twice, she finally got pregnant. Uh, so the body can store all sorts of material and chemical. I've had people put out you know 
mothball smells and nacho cheese smells and suntan oil smells and, you know, ke cleaning chemical smells and cosmetics. Cosmetics is the big one. Um, it, you know, they, their bodies are absorbing things. They're literally coating themselves in chemicals. And then, of course, later the body lets it out. But in <clears> this case, he's a very healthy guy. I mean, he didn't tell me that he's suntanned or anything like that. There's nothing to indicate particularly – yeah. Like some some retardant chemical that, that might be possible. And if I saw him again, unfortunately, he's at the end of his series. But I suspect he's going to feel so good that he's not going to need me for maybe ever, let alone it might be the longest time. Um, I mean, he's happy. But, you know, does he does he need me now that his body's ejected, whatever it was? But it's interesting it's because the Chinese, the Chinese specified do not breathe in what comes out of the cup. And so, so Ramon, it was in the cup. <laughs> so, Ramon, what I suppose, without being too, you know, like I know there's privacy concerns, what was the reason why these people decided they'd need to come to you, specifically, say, instead of going to their normal mainstream doctor? Well, he was there for a lot. He was there for alignment because he had too much curvature in his back, and okay. he had some pains related to working out. Yes. The other guy, the other guy hurt because he worked in a factory. And as I told you, the the other one, she's got through. She's not. She doesn't there of her own choice. Her mother brought her because she's having seizures. So I mean, she she wouldn't have chosen she's anything. Vegetable. She's a vegetable. She can't choose anything. Yeah. So she's been like a patient on and off over time. No, no, she's a new patient. It's literally just since this these solar flares and solar storms from June and July, um, yeah. the seizures began in July, becoming like really problematic and crying out and and uh, literally ca caterwauling throughout the night. And there's probably there's probably a physical obstruction, but in, in one scan they see the stone, and another scan they don't see the stone. So. You know, and she's so thin that there should be no reason they can't find a stone in this body. We're talking somebody who's under yeah. 50 pounds. So uh, very, yeah. a very strange and interesting case. What if it wasn't a stone in the first scan? What if it was a mass of charges that interfered with the. Uh, uh, in that case, it was a X-ray, I think. And then the next case was uh, uh, the, when they went to look for the stone, I think it was a sonogram. So the sonogram is using sound waves. The X-ray is obviously using the radio, uh, the EMF. So if there is a mass of charges inside of her kidney uh, blocking uh, the metabolic processes of the body, I mean, who knows? It could be even some kind of plasmoid, uh, for lack of a better word, ghost. Uh, and then the X-ray bounced uh, around it. And then it's not there anymore when they go to do the sonogram and there's no stone obvious. And I mean, she's so thin, you're talking about these sound waves are getting through. There's no problem. Again, you could you could sonogram someone else <laughs> through her body, you know? I mean, yeah. she's real, real thin, guys, real thin. Yeah. You know? We are energetic beings, certainly. We are. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's what makes the mystery so interesting. And also that the plasma was adjusting and um you know the fire and here's the other thing here's something really interesting so the flame when you first put the, the alcohol in a cotton ball it makes the the two to three inch flame but the flame also surrounds the whole the whole cotton ball and you get the blue flame near the cotton ball where the alcohol is burning right uh this wasn't doing that it would light and then the flame would move around the cotton ball it would try to establish all the the whole cotton ball, and then it would recede like bald spots on the cotton ball. But you know that there's still saturated with alcohol there. The alcohol would stop burning, so it yep. wasn't just small; it was not burning evenly. And as a rule, it takes a bit to put alcohol out. You've actually got to smother it. Yeah. Oh, it takes so it takes a yeah. Again, one cotton ball I can put on twenty to to thirty cups. Yeah. Um, with one saturated cotton ball. So we were talking about trying to attach one or two cups, and it's not it's not capable of doing it. Yeah. It's not it's not. It, if if you use mainstream chemistry to try and explain, you wouldn't be capable of explaining it. The yeah. room was not hum humid to that level. 
Um, it was it was totally breathable. There was I did not feel I was in a sauna. I even asked him if he goes to wet saunas. He does not go to wet saunas. So and did that have something to do with that void sort of idea that you were talking about? You know, which you know, were one of the things that was you know the disappearance of say, and that's the other thing. Yeah, General Bird. That was what it was, Dick, with the um when the ship disappeared, wasn't it? No, they were they were trying to use a, a Tesla device. It was a it was a Tesla device, and they were trying to disappear this American warship or something. Um, it got um, back in the fifties. Yeah, um, Operation. Yeah, what was that one? Remind you remember? I can't remember the uh, I can't remember the name of the ship though. Um, but yeah, it's something that Robert uh, talks about when he's on here. Um, I've been always been very skeptical of the story, but that's you know I don't have enough of the facts, and I don't know who does. You know, this kind of stuff gets classified. So, like, what we get is so is so limited and filtered that it's it's like harder to to pinpoint what what actually occurred and things get embellished. But I do believe something bizarre was going on on purpose. Um, yeah. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know if what was accomplished or, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's so many ways to skin that cat that it's, it's just flown out of my radar. I've not, I've not spent the time on it. No, but, no. Uh, a guy like Robert, he, he would have a whole bunch of uh, near enough facts that, you know, he would be able to, to spend some good yarn on it. But, um, I, I I am agnostic about the entire affair. Yeah, well, uh, I was just watching that Martin Fleischman report the other day, and uh, he has some theories on the uh, on the on these issues. And uh, the other thing about the Martin Fleischman report is uh, these uh, these uh, these fields are exactly what Tesla's tower seem to have uh, set up. Uh, these, these these two types of fields um, uh, producing this yin yang system and uh, and uh, a singularity, um, uh, which is all pretty amazing stuff. But uh, then you'll have to listen to this guy; he's a particle physicist, and uh, uh, he dis- he's been describing these things, um, evos, uh, exotic vacuum objects. They they kind of like these blue orbs, um, um, blue orbs, ball lightning. Uh, they seem to fly around with the mind of their own. Um, um, we of course, uh, we of course, uh, uh, also exhibit uh, vortex pr- properties, or so it's thought in a. And our uh, our energy uh, fields propagate around our body and around our immediate environment. Uh, you know, it's it's within our within our sort of uh, physical space, maybe three or four feet away, in our, in any direction. You know, you can you can feel someone else's field pretty. You know, uh, within that within that or so, on other animals or whatever within that. Uh, and uh, and of course these uh, these all exhibit the, the properties of the soliton, um, a beam a beam uh, going up and down the uh, up and down the spine, um, and then all these different radiating systems, uh, which uh, well in the, in the soliton the whole thing about it is you've got these wheels within wheels within wheels and. Uh, of, of uh, electricity traveling around in this around sort of the, the surface of a sphere, let's say, uh, um, and uh, uh, just just like in just like the Birkeland current and all the rest of it, apart from this is rotated in on itself, and these things can store an awful lot of um, of uh, electrical energy uh, um, charge. Um, the mag. Uh, Lots and lots of Teslas contained inside the objects, but there's an exclusion zone around the objects because all the fields uh, cancel each other out at, at, on certain uh, certain radii, 
and uh, so you can you, they don't necessarily interact with the outside world uh, which is an amazing thing so these uh, so these have been uh, seen flying around in various uh, places and for the last few hundred years uh, yep yeah, I've had so, people bring me pictures of them what's interesting though and the reason why I don't know about calling them vacuum objects per se, is that uh, the guy who brought me photos, they watched them come straight out of the ground. So you want to talk about a little bit of a mystery. If if these things are, you know, solely charge based, okay, and and I mean ultimately everything's charged, but I, you know you follow me. If they're if they're charged, then why are they coming out of the ground rather than going and getting stuck in the ground? And another thing is like ball lightning. You know, one of the aside from the fact that ball lightning has been uh, literally seen going through glass, wood, all sorts of stuff like that, uh, it's been found hanging out around fences, metal fences, like literally floating there and just chilling around fences. Um, and, and it's one of the most common places to see it is near uh, metal and wood fences on farms. So, think, um, I'm sorry. It's probably feeding off the off the charge. It could, uh, they it can could actually take well a fantastic it, amount of charge. These things. Uh, it could, but it could uh, if, you, well if you have a look at the Martin Fleischmann project, uh, he describes these things in much better detail, and uh, and he's um, he's quite an entertaining kind of guy. Uh, but he's been working on these things for quite a long time, and he's made some fantastic breakthroughs that. I've, that really relate to what we talk about. Well, uh, some you, some, of, some of these manifest themselves in uh, in ancient architecture, in ancient weaponry, and all sorts of things. You, it's, it, uh, I, I, I hope you listen to what he says. Well, um, I'll post some links. I will put it in the description along with uh, the thing that Andy shared about the Wicked Gardens. I'll put all that into the description for this show because uh, I think people will be interested to, to know more. The man who who recorded the ones coming out. Now I want to point out that these these the, his land is on the Daniel Boone ley line that I used to talk about uh, some of the electrogeology in Kentucky. Some of the most important stones that we have um, uh, for proving out electrogeology are in the Daniel Boone ley line. Uh, including ones that prove that if stratigraphy is happening, then the Earth has to have tilted, and if and if the Earth didn't tilt, then the stratigraphy disproves uniformitarian uh, stratigraphy. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have it uh, flat, then tilted at an angle, then flat, and then tilted at an angle, then flat, and then tilted at an angle, right? And there's multiple and multiple stones that uh, corroborate you know, throughout this ley line. So this long this long band of what is appears to me to have been uplifted and and there's all these arches because of the you know the andy hall bubble popping uh, that was occurring plus there is of course water and air erosion happening uh, to en enhance these arches um but this is the kind of area that he lives in and and a, a, an area which is well known to have a so-called sedona like vortex a chi vortex in in the area uh and you know the pictures are pretty unambiguous What's interesting is they're not all orbs. Some of them are um, oblate and uh, totally asymmetric, not not even formed, as if like they first emerge out of the ground and then take a shape, and then go flying about. And here's another thing: they can happen on farms. There have been people who've recorded uh, them coming out of the ground at the horse farms and then moving themselves closer towards the um, the the sea hinge. The Mount Horeb Sea Hinge that uh, I've talked about before that appears to have been a stray bolt. And it's important for people to know, like, oh, well, what if those are Indians and they're going to visit the, the sacred site? That might be true, but there are no burials inside the Mount Horeb um, uh, Sea Hinge Mound. The Sea Hinges were not used for burial mounds, either here or in the uh, British Isles, as far as I'm aware of over there. So these Sea Hinge Mounds, appear to be more a matter of like carved and then a crater rim discharge and then they just keep the mound alive by putting more uh dirt on it and uh, the electric fields when we measured at the at the mound um there was definitely a, a raise of electric field behavior inside the gap of the sea 
So there's there's something there, and it's attracting these orbs. People have have, have multiple people have corroborated that they see these orbs. Um, they don't they didn't see them emerge out of the ground, but they had to have come from somewhere. And then they are then they are moving across the ground at sunset towards the towards the sea hinge mound, and it and it creeps them out. They're they're totally creeped out, and so they leave. Uh, and so no one knows what happened. They form a yeah. ball and then they move all over the place. And I know of one man who also won the um, Bruce Grimes Award this year. His name is Arlen Andrews, and he is a sci-fi writer. But he, when he was a child, watched a ball lightning come through his kitchen window and then float above uh, the kitchen table and then go down and burn right into the table and uh, left a Lichtenberg pattern right into the table in front of him. Um, unfortunately, he's of the generation where that didn't automatically lead him to the electric universe, you know. But uh, he's he's well on it now, and he's worked with the government and done all sorts of stuff throughout his life. And like I say, he's a celebrated science fiction writer. Uh, you know, he didn't he didn't reach Arthur C. Clarke levels, but he he is of that level. You know, he's really really high quality celebrated uh, science fiction writer. People want to look him up, Arlen Andrews. Uh, well, these, so these phenomena, these phenomena. <laughs> These phenomena can actually create and destroy matter, apparently, as well. Uh, annihilate matter and create matter. Don't they leave, like, a form of ash that's uh, been measured and it has all sorts of random uh, heavy elements in it and stuff? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, and they have very specific patterns. And uh, and these, uh, these crop up in all sorts of things. And... Um, uh, I watched one of the programs from a couple of months ago, which was very interesting because um, there's a there's some kind of an artifact in the uh, uh, in the desert, and I think it's uh, I think it's uh, near that Area Fifty One, um, and it's um, it's a massive uh, one of these things carved on the ground. Uh, they thought it were by the Indians, apparently. But it, it's absolutely bears this. Uh, it's it's absolutely a spitting image of this um, uh, this uh, uh, how, how when you set these charges up in uh, in the, in a particular way, you get this yin yang vortex happening and a singularity, uh, which is meant to, uh, like I was saying, squeeze. Squeeze into things into the size of a plank length, and then send them send them down, um, send them down out the top of the vortex in the form of uh, a, a neutrons apparently, and then uh, basically to uh, to reappear somewhere else in another vortex uh, potentially. Um, so that's where this uh, all this warship thing came in. Um, but anyway, Rob Greenier, uh, he's identified one of these in the, uh, I think it's in the Utah desert, um, and it's associated with all sorts of uh, thousands of little blue balls popping out of there. <laughs> now, he thinks it might might have been weaponized by someone, but uh, that remains to be seen. Um, I'll try and find some links anyway for it and put, a, put them up with this show. It, it would be interesting if the government figured this, this all out. And, of course, they started admitting about the ball lightning in the late 90s and early 2000s. But let's say, let's suppose that they figured it out in the 1950s while researching the Byfield brown effect and went out and documented these ball lightnings. And then they're out generating these things. And then they're exactly. and, 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 and exactly. terracing the, the, the planes and such, right? And they're just giant versions of these EVOs. Um, another obviously hypothesis of what they would be would be hyperdimensional beings, whether they were alien or actual fairies and stuff like that. Uh, and that you have to be um, either a child or a psychic to actually interpret what you see into the shape that it actually is in another ethereal plane. That is a common belief. Bear in mind that Kentucky um, not only is it a place of high electrical geology, but also stories of Bigfoot before the cultural phenomenon known as Bigfoot. And these Bigfoot here, uh, unlike other ones in lots of places, not only are they smaller, but they are said to be able to appear and disappear at their own whim. So they're, they're, they're said to uh, be, I haven't seen any myself. 
but they're said to to be capable of suddenly appearing and be just like any other animal. Like literally one of the stories is this kid, he was out hunting and then he hears this huge tumble and crash and turns around and one's rolling down the hill and splashes in the water rather embarrassingly and then they stare at each other. And then some other ones start appearing. He ran, he runs for his life. And, you know, he says before that, I didn't believe in anything. And, you know, and it was obviously a very embarrassing experience. So I didn't tell anybody about me running from these things. Um, but then the other stories of that, that they can appear and then just like you see them and now you see them. Now you don't. And they just disappear. And what's really fascinating is that the, the in, in Kentucky, the place of the most sightings is not where uh, I was talking about the, the Daniel Moon Ley Line with the people, but um, closer to where the Lichtenbergs, uh, the knobs are, and also where the ancients lived, uh, where the um, the Shelbins and stuff. So the, it's sort of the middle, the very mid-central part of Kentucky when you look at it lengthwise. Uh, that area, especially around Negro Hill, and uh, the various swamps that are that are in that area, not the bayou. The bayou is in the far western Kentucky, near to the west, the Mississippi River. Um, and I've looked, and I've not found a plethora. This is what's really weird. I thought I would find a plethora of bayou-related ghosts and swamp monster stories. I I have not so far, and I, I haven't asked the locals. Um, and I would like to go hiking the Bayou de Chin, but I I haven't. It's it's the swamps in the middle of the state. And the forest there is where a lot of these sightings uh, have been. Now, this could be really bored people, but um, considering most of Kentucky is is rural, there shouldn't be an extra concentration of these stories in a certain area. It should be like kind of a generalized all over the place. And bear in mind, this is the area of which the Cherokee at one point had their stronghold near to the Mammoth Caves um, because they were known as the people of the caves. So. If the Cherokee version of this Bigfoot uh, can appear and disappear, um, and then we're talking about these objects and they've, they've come out of the ground, we've got actual photographs of, of these things coming out of the ground. Might there be some form of uh, dimensional ether in which if you're in the right train of mind uh, or your mind is open, say like as a child or as a psychic or whatever, that you are capable of interpreting that information into a form and then that might be also something if you're out hunting and you're out hiking and you're in the wonder of nature, your body is known to release DMT. If that DMT alters the brain to where you also now have that ability, might you see things that you wouldn't normally see as in fairies, et cetera. I mean, there's documentaries from the, the British Isles um, and the stories are all pretty much the same, uh, you know, a small child. Uh, is visited by a being. The being takes them inside the rock. They go play for uh, a long period of time for them, and then they come back, and everybody's like, "Hey, you've been gone for a couple hours. Where have you gone?" Oh, well, I've just spent a you know a month in inside the rock with the fairies. Uh, and these kinds of stories are common not only in the British Isles, but they're also common in Africa and in uh, or Aboriginal Australia, etc. Uh, these kinds of beings existing and convincing children. Uh, most especially, or very childlike young uh, young women and uh, occasionally men, but mostly women, uh, to that they can come and join them and live inside these rocks. And I think that's an incredibly bizarre phenomenon. Uh, and then, of course, it does discount also the possibility of hyperdimensional beings that are visiting from somewhere else completely, and we can't see their form because of the geometries that they're existing in. So all these things have to be stepped through very carefully, and what isn't helpful is is a culture that is just discounts everything when there are so many cultures for thousands of years that have literally seen and recorded these things uh, in their testimony and passed them on. And now we've got photographs and it's just like the ball lightning. No, it doesn't exist. It's not possible until they finally got video of these daggone things uh, hanging out near fences and moving around <laughs> in fields. And they're like, well, what is that? Well, no one knows. Because you go try to chase it down with a Langmuir probe and stick it in there, it's going to run away. It's going to like, you know, gone. Chase, chase, chase it with a fighter jet. Can't keep up. Now, Nick, you're you're closest to those kinds of stones. Have you heard any locals that admitted they themselves uh, were taken inside the stones as children? Uh, no, but I mean, there are there are there are thousands of. Uh, 
tales, as you say, about uh, fairies, fairies cult living in uh, caves in storms. Um, they generally, uh, yeah, they generally ended up uh, taking people away, broken a promise or something like that. You know, uh, they'd normally uh, be, be whisked into the uh, into the mountain and never seen again. You know, that kind of thing. And that used to happen quite a lot, and and and. All of the Pennines, these, these stories exist. And uh, there's some people think that they go back to um, um, sort of the Abrahamic times, you know, 2000 BC. Um, where, where I was living on the hill last year, uh, there's a, a, a local legend which was set only 500 yards away from where I was um, about, about um, Oberon and Titania. Uh, king, king and queen of the fairies, and this this story meant, was meant to have happened in the 13th century, uh, just down in this valley close to me. Um, very interesting little story, to be honest. Published and everything um, since the same, since been published off this uh, this particular reverend. Uh, they got all the local stories and turned them into blockbusters and published them for a lot of money. Um, but at the same time, he plundered out any available archaeology um, and just left it a complete mess. You know, all the, uh, the Iron Age graves that plundered a couple of very big uh, old age graves. Found a few bits and bats in there. Um, but yeah, uh, I think wherever you, I think wherever you look, there's uh, uh, stories of uh, supernatural things living in caves. Uh, just lot, lots and lots of authors, you know, and it's in it's in the local it's in the local psyche, really, you know. I think uh, I think at one point people had to live in caves a lot more than they than they would now. I certainly be underground in mines and you know digging around underground. And also, not to be too fine a point to it, but. Um... We always talk about the stories about giants because of you know what was written very briefly in the Bible, which might be mistranslated. But actually, the more ubiquitous story is of these little gnomes or trolls or whatever you want to call them, like little people that live inside of stones. And in Kentucky, we have a plethora of these rocks that have what the, the Sami people from uh, Russia call gnome homes, uh, and they look like little like little pueblo. Uh, cities and obviously their erosive pro, uh, pro processes. But what's interesting is that this erosion, um, right, it should be happening to the same to sandstone all over the place. But these stones are actually a little bit isolated. And there, I, I found and I have a great photo of me next to a set of uh, these quote gnome homes that are right at the Mantle Rock, um, which is where the Trail of Tears went through when the Cherokee were expelled. And uh, here's an interesting thing. So, you know, uh, we went up on top of the the uh, glade there, the sandstone glade, and there was a confusing um, field that was trying to get me lost. And so I turned us around and uh, there were cacti up on top of there, which until then I didn't really understand that there are prickly pear cacti throughout Kentucky. I just didn't know. And uh, so that night, uh, this, this is this is a very interesting story. So, and in the earlier in the day before Mantle Rock, we had visited the Wycliffe Indian mounds, and my kids had danced upon the mounds because it's open, you know. And they were little kids, little little kids, and there was such an angry like uh, thunderstorm energy in the air. It was very uh, foreboding, and the forests around the mounds are very unhealthy. Well, then, so we went to the Mantle Rock, and it's, like, beautiful and everything, but there's this confusion energy. Well, that night, uh, my son started to get sick, and so I, I curled up with him, and I put his back to my chest, and I said a prayer, and something zipped out of him and hit me in the second Don Tien here in the chest and then rippled across my back. Like, I felt as if uh, I saw glass being shattered, and, uh, and, and he didn't get sick anymore. He, he, he got better. Uh, but my myself felt that I had taken in the remnants of this Mississippian culture. And the, the, the story only gets interesting in one more way. Um, in the same the same pain in my cheek that occurred when I pissed off the AI uh, and was making fun of its uh, whatever, 
I have had that pain before, only in the other side of the other the other cheek on this side on the right. Uh, when I had a phone call with that archaeologist who was trying to say that the Creek Indians were the creators of all these stone mounds down in the south, um, I myself found him aggravating because he was so um, arrogant. And he's like, oh, what what stories to hear? And I said, well, how about the 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 Cherokee myths that are passed down to in the Mooney text? And he's just extremely dismissive, young man, because he just knows everything, right? And he's like, "Well, the Cherokee or the Creek agree," and I'm sitting there going, "They'll they'll agree with you for anything in order to get you know published as famous." Uh, but they themselves, the Indians, said that they weren't the ones who built these mounds. And uh, so as I'm talking to the guy, and I'm having a normal conversation just like this, right? I'm not getting that aggravated. This trying in my cheek and i just instantly knew that it was that mississippi whatever it was that mississippian energy that i had pulled out of my son was manifesting itself in wanting to speak um but in its frustration unable to speak it hurt it physically hurt my jaw i mean i needled the jaw i massaged the jaw all day long and it didn't stop hurting until the next day um and obviously i didn't make a dent in this guy uh this archaeologist i, I can't remember his name but he was I mean, he was frankly kind of a punk, you know, and he was really arrogant. He felt so proud of his work. And I'm sitting there going like, but you're lying because the Indians themselves have said many times that they didn't build the mounds. So, you know, like <laughs> you're just you're just totally off. And uh, this 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 energy, whatever it is that my kids had picked up at the mounds and then transferred to me was not happy uh, about uh, what was being said. And I felt that it was an incredible pain and pressure uh, in, in the jaw, much sharper than what I felt when the AI was uh, <laughs> a simulating being a megalomaniac as a GPT-3. Um, it was a totally different level of sharp pain. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, and it lasted the entire day. I couldn't get rid of it. But anyway, uh, that that's that entire story. Of, I have no idea if there was anything in the stones in the gnome homes, but there that there were these incredible gnome homes, like some of the best looking of this kind of rock uh, that I've ever seen at the Mantle Rock, which is the longest arch east of the Mississippi River, um, where the Trail of Tears went through. Uh, is all very interesting, quote coincidence, right? I mean, it's all coincidence until something's proven, but it's. It's a little too coincidental, is my is my personal opinion. Um, and with that, guys, I have to be I have to be logging off. But I, I obviously invite you to continue, you know, uh, sharing your stories and talking. Uh, no, I think I'm I'm just about done in my head as well. Uh, what about you, Andy? Oh, yeah, I'm killed then, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, great. Just great. Yeah, Nick. So I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll Nick post that. I'll post yeah. that. Um, I'll post that show uh, on the thing uh, right now, Ramon. Uh, that Martin Thank Fleischman. But I, I recommend you, you to much. look at his, look at a lot of this stuff. Well, I think it's. Uh, I think it'd be very interesting, uh, no matter what. And I'll provide the links in the description for both of these things for people to go and look. I wish I had copies of the photographs uh, that that guy brought to the AKHA meeting and that he had e emailed me. I really don't honestly know, or he texted me. I mean, I really don't know how to find those or to find him per se. So um, people are just going to have to take my, my word for it that he photographed these things and they were oblong. They weren't, they weren't even oblong. They were like shaped in all sorts of shapes. And some of them had formed orbs and had floated around. And he said he had even more pictures and even video. But, you know, he didn't bring that with him. He just brought his notebook. And uh, these things uh, are really common. And, and what's interesting and is in common of the British Isles and all these Celtic traditions is, of course, the earthworks also. So we have the electrogeology, the catastrophic history, the Arthurian tales, and the earthworks. And now we're talking about these potential EVO ball lightning, orbs, whatever you want to call it, uh, really common in this area. So, you know, these these coincidences are a little too coincidental, in my opinion. Um, they aren't scientific solvings, but they are indicative that more thorough research is needed, in my opinion.
That's my official opinion. <laughs> yeah, and cool. the thing well, is, though, the thing is, though, Ramon, a lot of those things are so intermittent. It's very hard. Oh yeah, to sort of set research to them. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, um, I, I think there's been people. ongoing research into these uh, phenomena since Terence M. Brown. Uh, he talks about all this. He talks about all the uh, cold fusion experiments and, um, you know, uh, how, how that projects have been set up. He's, uh, he's been involved in that side of life as well, you know, so he's, uh, he's quite an interesting guy to talk. Uh, oh, absolutely. If people aren't aware of uh, the anything of the T.T. Brown work, please look into that. There's even some stuff that's been the, that's being sold on Amazon that's actually worth having copies of and it help them to become familiar with the Byfield Brown effect anyways. So like at a very minimum, get familiar with that because that is a well-known, legit scientific thing and has everything to do with the secret space programs. But uh, I got to yeah. go so we can pick it up next time with... Uh, Malone and and Brown and uh, and uh, you know uh, Townsend and all these guys and we can we can keep going. Great stuff. All right, then. No worries, Ramon. See you next, Ramon.